Um, welcome. My name is Julia Sizek, and I am a postdoctoral scholar here at Social Science Matrix. Today, as you all know, we are here as part of our Author Meets Critic series, in which we discuss exciting new works by faculty in the Social Sciences Division. Our book today is Reactionary Mathematics, A Genealogy of Purity by Massimo Mazzotti. As promised by the title, the book is a look into the history of mathematics and more specifically the late 18th and early 19th century and the Neapolitan resistance to French styles of mathematical practice. This revolution in mathematics, Mazzotti argues, should be examined alongside the political movements at the time. A pure mathematics, he suggests, is a project of a certain kind of political, social, and economic order. This wide-ranging book is of interest to many of you here, and perhaps you arrived thanks to the efforts of our co-sponsors for this event, the uh, Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society, and the History Department. So thanks to them. Before we begin, I'm just going to discuss a couple of our upcoming events that we have coming at Matrix. So on October 31st, Halloween, very spooky, we have uh, the California Spotlight on From Boom to Doom in San Francisco about the so-called Doom Loop, which I assure you is a very terrifying topic. Uh, on November 14th, Dilling Penningroth will be presenting his book, Before the Movement, The Hidden History of Black Civil Rights. On November 28th, Sharad Chari will present, be presenting his short book, Gramsci at Sea. And then finally, um, for the purposes of this, um, we will be having um, a event featuring the work of graduate students um, called New Directions in Gender and Sexuality toward the end of the semester. So to register for all of these events, you just go um, to our website, which is matrix.berkeley.edu. And so um, just so you know, um, the way that this event will proceed is first, we will um, have our moderator introduce everyone, and then we will proceed to have some discussion up here, and then we'll open it up to Q&A around the room. So I will be introducing our lovely moderator, Tom LeCure. Um, LeCure is the Helen Fawcett Distinguished Professor Emeritus, wow, that's a mouthful, at the University of California, Berkeley. His work has been focused on the history of popular religion and literacy, on the history of the body, alive and dead, and on the history of death and memory. He writes regularly for the London Review of Books and the Three Penny Review, among other journals, and is a founding editor of Representations. LeCure is a member of both the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His most recent book is The Work of the Dead, A Cultural History of Mortal Remains, and he's currently working on a book called The Dog's Gaze in Western Art, to be published very soon. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you. So we ha we have a remarkable panel um, today to discuss the, to discuss this book. Remarkable in the sense of the distinction of these of, uh, of the panelists, but also that they actually know something about this subject, which is um, you know, not always the case. Um, so just to the left is David Bates, um, professor of rhetoric at Berkeley, but for many years active very active in the Center for New Media and now in the Center for Science, Technology, uh, Medicine, and Society. Um, she's a scholar, an Enlightenment scholar. There's a book called Enlightenment, Aberrations, Era, and Revolution in France, and States of War, Enlightenment, Origins um, of Politics. Uh, he's now working on a book on artificial um, on, on his artificial history of natural uh, intelligence. And one further to the left is, is our visitor from afar, um, Matthew Jones, he's a Smith Family Professor of History at Princeton. Um, he focuses on the history of information um, technologies and artificial intelligence, as well as the history of science um, and technology in early modern Europe. Um, but actually now he's not working on early modern Europe. He's working on, on uh, postmodern America, uh, a history of, uh, of surveillance uh, since 9-11. Um, uh, but relevant to what we're talking about today is how data happened, a, his, a history from the age of reason uh, to the age of, of algorithms. And before that, uh, what book on the history of science, more generally uh, the good life of the scientific revolution, Descartes, Pascal, Leibniz, and the cultivation of virtue. 
um, and, and other books and works. But in any case, also in, the, in this general field. Now, Massimo Mazzotti, our, our, our colleague and, and uh, the main event, I want to introduce him actually by reading from the Review of Nature. It's a good place, for, a rare place for a historian to have a... Um, so here's what Nature says. There are some books that hook you, that hook you straight from the title. Reactionary Mathematics by Massimo Mazzotti is one of them. What does the title even mean? It feels as a bizarre juxtaposition of two seemingly unrelated terms like literary biology or electrical jurisprudence. <laughs> so then it goes on to say that many people have perceived mathematics as separate, uh, or it's the most independent of these di disciplines from the social science, but not, not Mazzotti. Mazzotti's first merit is to break this pattern and take us to a different sphere where mathematics, science, culture, art, and society, and history converge revealing new interpretive possibilities. Indeed, the review concludes, the complex relationship between tradition and modernization is the pulsing heart of this engaging book. Besides a valuable historical analysis, reactionary mathematics offers an interesting and useful synthesis, I to correct his grammar, useful synthetic vision. He's Italian, let's go ahead. Um, to help us understand in these times of rapid and convulsive transformations, the mathematics of the present, and most importantly, the reason for the mathematics to come. So what else can I say, except that uh, Massimo is the Thomas M. Siebel uh, Chair, um, History of Science in our department. Um, and his earlier book is also in some sense about the cultural history of, of mathematics, uh, the world of Maria Gaetana Agnesi, mathematician, um, of God. So Matthew will speak. We'll have both respondents. Matthew will respond, and then I'll call on everyone for questions. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's probably useful if I don't speak too much and we have a conversation. So maybe I just give you some coordinates uh, just to give a sense of where we are, because um, one problem here is that it's a fairly obscure story uh, in the history of mathematics. So it's, it's like pretty, I mean, darkness when it comes to my colleagues, you know, mostly when I talk to them about this. So um, at the center of the book, there is a short chapter in which I talk about the mathematical controversy, which was not very relevant. I mean, actually quite marginal to the overall history of mathematics in Europe in the 18th, 19th century. And that is actually the core of the story, but somehow um, I didn't know exactly where to put it because I really want to tell about things that have to do with that controversy. Right. So the book is mostly about the meaning of that controversy. And then at the center of the book, then I decided, okay, I put it at the center. It's really at the center of the story. I'll put it physically at the center as well. So the the story is, is, is relatively simple. It's like uh, the controversy is about two groups at the margins of enlightened Europe, the kingdom of Naples, which is well known, but is well known for the Vesuvius, for some mm -hmm. of the natural, for Herculanum, so artistic, natural, historical remakes. Um, not really a powerhouse in mathematics. That's, that's Paris. Those are some other places in Europe that are really that kind of place. Um, but there is this, this um, controversy that, is, that goes on from roughly the 1790s to the, to the 1830s, age of revolution, right? Um, and, and this has to do with, you know, what is the best way to solve one version of it? A simple version of it is, what is the best way to solve a geometrical problem? Should we be using all kinds of algebraic techniques, even though they don't really reflect the, geomet the initial geometrical problem, but it's like we turn the geometrical problem into through analytical, you know, uh, Cartesian geometry, right? But even more than that, you can actually use calculus and other things so that you really move distant from the original geometrical problem. You operate on those algebraic uh, formulas, you get numbers. Those numbers, you interpret them as giving you the, the answer to the geometrical problem. So you go back and you, okay, you solve the problem. Uh, or should we stick with the geometrical, with geometry, 
Right? And should we actually only reason in geometrical terms, which means like you know, you kind of Euclidean geometry? Obviously, we are talking about fairly sophisticated versions of it, but still, should we actually be in the world of uh, seeing geometrical figures, either physically or with our imagination? or in the world of what they would call blind calculations, because you don't really see anything when you're crunching numbers, right? You're just crunching numbers. So at the core is this kind of debate. And uh, what is surprising, I mean, this is just one of the many versions of algebra versus geometry, which is kind of a long lasting story in the history of mathematics. But at that moment, at that juncture of European history, um, it seems to me that it takes a particular significance, also because there is an unusual um, in emotional investment into this debate that it doesn't immediately, uh, it's not immediately justified right, by, by the actual content. And you find the supporters of the geometrical approach, the synthetic approach, synthetic geometry, meaning essentially you know, Euclidean geometry, um, arguing that if you actually use the algebraic methods, you are perverting the mind of your students, your mind is perverted, the results are gonna be catastrophic for mathematics, which will be degraded, and for society at large, because you are introducing a false certainty. You're introducing false mathematical reasonings that then are used by people who, for example, are doing political economy or other things with your mathematical tools. And they trust you because you have, as a mathematician, you have endorsed them, you have legitimated them. So there is a question of what is the legitimated set of tools that one should be using. And this is invested immediately in moral, epistemological moral terms and terms that often evoke a social crisis, right? This, this, will, this is um, guiding us into some kind of uh, absolutely wrong direction. So um, the trajectory of the controversy is really it kind of, as many controversies, it just uh, disappears into insignificance. At some point, it's not relevant in the 30s. But between the 90s and the 20s, really ma mathematical, mathematical and scientific life, because this invests everyone who's using mathematics, so from the engineers to um, cartographers, um, anyone who's actually a scientist, right, at that point of, of natural philosopher uh, in, in Naples, uh, is, is, is really one of the most sort of heated and, and, and um, uh, apparently significant uh, controversies. So what I do in the other chapters is to give you a sense that I zoom into the controversy from the point of view of the analytics, let's call them that way, right? those who are arguing for the value of algebraic reasoning and the power of algebraic reasoning, so that we see the story from their side. Uh, the story of, of from their side is a story of the trust in a universal analytic reason, let's call it that way, that is essentially reflects the deep structure of nature. And is also, it also expresses the deep structure of our own mind. Right? The two things are isomorphic. Uh, and you might think of French mathematics in the late 18th century, the likes of Condorcet and others. I really think along those lines. I mean, this is not just a mathematical technique like others. This is what they call analysis, which is not what we call analysis today. It's, it's kind of a set of techniques that have to do with algebra, calculus, uh, but it's not a coherent theory by any means. Uh, but what you do when you're using those techniques, you're actually using something that is deeply ingrained in the human mind and in nature. And so the legitimation of those techniques is the world somehow. Right? It doesn't need to be grounded into something else. I mean, that's not that's not the problem that they are, are thinking about. Um, this... Um, Historically, this the way in which I see um, this coming together into the controversy is that there is a phase of uh, in which these kind of arguments are used by reformists in late 18th century Naples to, Naples to argue for essentially criticizing established institutions 
social institutions and offer suggesting some transformation. Right? So it's a kind of reformist push based on mathematical arguments. So there are better ways of, for example, organizing a certain productive process. The rules of algebra are telling us, are telling us what these ways are. So they're guiding us, they can guide us rationally. Um, things get a bit more uh, extreme in the 90s uh, when essentially the, um, after the, the, um, uh, the Bastille and the 1789, the, the government, the king, the, the king and the court and turned actually dramatically uh, on a kind of anti-French and conservative side. Um, and at that point, um, any argument that might sound like uh, universal reason applied to the transformation of society is not really very welcome anymore. Uh, and, and in fact, people who have been marginal in the scientific world up to that point, an interesting group of mystically inclined mathematicians were defending some kind of essentially invented tradition of uh, mathematical ge of, uh, ge Euclidean geometry become central to uh, scientific life in the Kingdom of Naples. They become professors at universities. I mean, really, they occupy all the possible spaces in that world. So like in the turn of three years, you see a completely different scientific world in which now the, 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 the essential scientific life is controlled by those who believe that Euclidean geometry should be uh, the only basis of any mathematical procedure. So um, just to cut it short and um, the relevance of this in terms of why do they care so much? Well, if you argue that um, there is an unrestricted possibility of applying algebra and calculus to reform the economy, political life, reorganize the elect creating an electoral system the way that Condorcet does, for example, uh, trade, uh, the landscape, right? So civil engineering. Civil engineers are legitimated by their own use of analysis in reshaping, for example, designing new roads, unifying the system, standardizing uh, weights and measures. So that is what is being legitimated by the kind of uh, universal rationality. Let's say that the idea of uh, analytic reason that goes beyond right, any contingent expression of, uh, uh, of technical and mathematical knowledge. On the other hand, uh, the move to Euclidean geometry as the only legitimated foundation is a way of restricting the use of mathematics in a particular way so that you, mathematics is still core in the university curriculum uh, the way that it was, it's, it was an, um, a significant discipline, but now it's the movement of techniques from mathematics to other fields that is much more complicated and not legitimated. Because geometry, I mean, as Galileo realized, you can do only so much in terms of quantifying reality and transforming reality through quantification with Euclidean geometry. Um, so this was the, the, the Napolitan story is a story of essentially restricting the possibility of using certain algebraic techniques uh, because these algebraic techniques had been used by the Jacobins who essentially um, in 1799 are able to seize power just for five months and set up uh, a Jacobin Republic. Right? And if you look at how they organize the Republic, it's, it's kind of an analytic Republic. It's all they, they they have a way of thinking that is pretty much the way of thinking of the analytical mathematician. And, and in fact, it's interesting that the president of the Republic and is one of his main assistants, first thing they do, they publish a textbook of mathematics. Because they say, well, this is the way we need to think about the world. Because if you want to transform the world, you need to analyze it, which essentially means to break it down to its elementary components. Uh, this is one of the, the old meanings of analysis, is, is this. And then combining these components, so the combinatorial element of analysis, in order to construct something new based on those on those components, right? 
and how do you construct something new following the universal rules of algebra, right? which somehow is giving us, is guiding us. Right? Uh, so once the Jacobins have essentially built up their own discourse around, around I mean, egalitarianism, anti-clericalism, redistribution of wealth analysis. I mean, that's what you find in Jacobin texts. Uh, at that point, analysis, I mean, is like, you cannot go back to analysis without being associated with the Jacobin, with Jacobin politics. And so the reactionary mathematics of the title is, is, is literally the reaction to that moment. It's literally a moving mathematics away from a conscious, self-reflective way of using mathematics as a transformative tool for redistributing agency, essentially, across society, because that is, <clears throat> at the bottom, that's what they were doing, right? Redistributing political agency uh, with, you know, uh, across society in a way that would empower subaltern groups that had never been empowered. The reaction is to make that a logical impossibility, a mathematical impossibility. And you make that by saying that that mathematics is not reliable. Obviously, we're not just talking about Euclidean geometry. And the example I can give is um, that this is actually a much bigger story than Naples. And if if after having, but the, Naples, the Neapolitan story is instructive because it's so extreme that you see everything is in your face. The, the political value of mathematics is there. They talk about it. They write about it. Whereas if you look at Paris, for example, right, the main place at the time, where Cauchy, Augustine Cauchy, is uh, re revolutionizing mathematics, as many historians have said at this point. And what is he doing? He's not going back to geometry. And that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a bizarre idea that could only happen in a marginal place. Is restructuring algebraic and uh, essentially calculus, algebraic techniques and calculus, um, and the term is rigorization, the rigorization of calculus. You may have heard that. This is something that happens in the first half of the 19th century. And essentially the outcome is pretty much modern mathematics as we know it. And this rigorization of calculus is, is a way of restricting the use of calculus. It's a way of saying, well, you need to be really precise enough of this kind of voluntaristic, enthusiastic, you know, 18th century d'Alembert-like use of mathematics. You know, tell me exactly what you're doing and tell me exactly what are the the the, the limits, right? There are many new things that comes up around at this time which are all designed to specify under which conditions certain formulas can be used and for which quantities of the values that are part of their formula not because you cannot just give for granted that you can use any formulas uh, apply to any field and with without restrictions so so if you read that after having come across the napolitan story you see that what he's doing is the same thing that this bizarre napolitan napolitan mystic mathematicians were doing in a more um bizarre way, I would say, but it's, it's the same thing, is restricting the applicability of mathematics, particularly to issues that have to do with politics and theology and metaphysics. Uh, he's arguing that there are many kinds of truths, that not everything is reducible at the same level of, uh, uh, of you know, at the same epistemological level, and that the mathematicians, they're talking about pure, the, the world of pure mathematics. That's the purity of the title. Right? This is pure mathematics at this point is becoming the foundation of mathematics. And, and why do we need the foundation of mathematics? Well, because if mathematics is not embedded in the world anymore or in our own reason, then we really need the f something like a foundation for this body of knowledge. And the foundational crisis that we have a few of them in the history of mathematics, but this is one. And I suggest the anxiety that it provokes, the fact that people like the, the Neapolitans or Cauchy are really uh, anxious about the scandal of the lack of foundation of mathematics, is in fact the scandal of the, of the unrestricted application of mathematics. And the fact that we need to ground it, it needs to be understood as a self-included body of knowledge that is really 
not the essential structure of reality, something else. So then you have all these considerations about how come the mathematics is, is effective, for example, right? If it's, because if you start to think of it as something completely different, detached, and somehow endowed of a purity, purity meaning is not um, polluted by empirical considerations, right? Uh, which is a very modern way of thinking about mathematics, because if you go back in time, most people will think about mixed mathematics, right? Mathematics is always something in between. It's like astronomy or music. Whereas this is like a distinctively modern way of thinking of mathematics as something that is really its own world. And so then it takes a lot of work to make it function, and you need to justify you know, uh, any, any use of those techniques into the real world. Uh, so I think that's uh, probably more than enough. But just to give you a sense of it, that's what essentially the story is about, with a lot of detail. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we have an, an order? Do, do we, can, do we, David? I think I was next. Yes. <laughs> it's hard to go after after the, the star of the show. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep this kind of short. I have lots of notes. Um, but just picking up on, on your... Your last point, um, I think it's more than just that story and some details. Uh, the book is actually much more unruly than Massimo gives it credit for, <laughs> and I, I mean that in a in a positive way. But I'll I'll start by saying um, a, a brief anecdote. When I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, my first semester, I took a course from the cultural historian um, Carl Weintraub. I don't know if anyone reads him anymore. Um, and for some reason, I got tagged as the postmodern kind of Yahoo of the class, uh, constructivist, relativist, and and uh, uh, basically willing to undermine all these kinds of values. Um, but there was one point in the class when I, I guess I'd read Kuhn and Feyerabend when I was an undergraduate. So uh, these things just came kind of naturally. But at one point he said, but what about mathematics? And he kind of stopped me in my tracks because I couldn't really, I didn't have anything to say about okay. that. How do you historicize something as 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 pure as mathematics? So that sort of stuck with me as I as I read <clears throat> more in in history of science and history of mathematics. But I never really read something as as good as your book, to be honest. That really took that seriously to demonstrate how the most pure logical step has to be understood, contextualized in a very rich and and detailed way. So I'll, I'll just admire and, and suggest that you read the, the introduction, which really gives a, a really good overview of, of some of the, the ways that mathematicians approach history, both for better or for worse. But I think what's really brilliant about the argument here, as, as Massimo's kind of um, demonstrated already, is that at its heart is an idea that the very idea of, of the logical purity or the neutrality of mathematics has a history and that we have to do this kind of very close work to understand what's going on in that longer history of mathematics. So in the introduction, we get this, this really interesting view, which is that we don't have mathematics so much as a mathematical culture. And that culture includes a really important, uh, what he calls an image of reason, a kind of practice as well as theory of reason. And, and this, this image of reason is, is predicated on concepts of order. And then we can slide nicely into the, the, the repercussions, which is essentially that any mathematical culture is going to have some implication um, on the social and political plane because concepts of order and concepts of rationality um, infuse what we really mean by social and political action. So, so the introduction takes takes on that 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 job of of, of showing exactly what a history of I, I even want to say it's maybe not a history of mathematics so much as a history of reason mm -hmm. with a mathematical core, but but you really do have a larger scope in the whole book. It's not just about the specifics of the mathematicians, but but the the, the, the image of reason and the image of order that, that goes along with that. So so now I have armature for that. If I could go back in time, I'd have armature <laughs> for how to demonstrate. You, you have this lovely line that that what counts as a step in logical deduction always had to be constrained by this mathematical culture that that every every step in a logical deduction has to be understood in in terms of its its context okay so the book as you as you described is like an x it has this core 
which is probably the most mathematical part of the book. It's it's kind of like a textbook. It really mm -hmm. teaches you what the difference between analytic and geometrical forms um, are. But it also raises these bigger questions. Basically, the synthetics are arguing, as Massimo says, that the art of inventing is not algorithmic and can never be algorithmic. Whereas the algebraists were, were arguing that analysis could be understood as a universal form of reasoning. Those are Massimo's phrases. Um, but analysis is is the the kind of catching point of the whole book because it can be celebrated as well as denigrated as mechanical and automatic. And I think that's one of the interesting threads of the book: the fact that analysis has 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 in some ways an agreement on both sides that its mechanical character is really essential to understanding it. So the the book is an X with this this sort of central core. The first part of the book follows the algebraic world and the second part of the book is the synthetic world but i really do want to say that i think that you're underselling the book by giving it this narrative of mathematics because mm -hmm. what really happens is like i said it's kind of kaleidoscopic and at times unruly it delves into all sorts of different topics i just realized the library of congress also undersells your book it it says it's the topics are mathematics study and teaching italy naples <laughs> mathematics political aspects. <laughs> uh, when you read it, the first four chapters are actually like if Naples was a marginal space in this period, it was a pretty entertaining one. <laughs> so what you have is is really a political history wrapped up in a history of science, wrapped up in a history of mathematics, wrapped up in a history of administration. It's really rich territory and it flows between different kinds of characters and different zones. But the the intricacies of the French incursion and the reaction and then the French decade, as it's called, is really interesting stuff. And it really follows, I would say, these mathematical cultures and even larger cultures of reason as they battle out in, in a number of different spheres. So just for example, chapter four on the shape of the kingdom, it's really what, like, like many of these great books that you're citing that study the Enlightenment and 19th century that gets into the conceptual world behind everything from infrastructure reform, landscape and cartography, an excursus in the history of statistics in Italy and its use in political economy, the um, attempted transformation of the weights and measure system. These are all well beyond just the mathematical debate that, that you take as the core of the, the book. And it's really interesting stuff that pays off in a, in a beautiful way with an analysis of landscape painting as well. So this is the kind of book you could show some of those pictures in there after if you wanted to. Um, the, the last part of the book, I'll just say, they're not quite the heroes, but these sort of weird mystic synthetics are treated really um, generously is the word, I think, mm -hmm. by Massimo. It takes seriously their concerns and I think makes the argument that, that I've also made a similar argument mm -hmm. with respect to conservative thinking that there's no such thing as a going back, that these conservatives are really reactionary and that they're forging new models of politics, of science and reason. And you take that seriously. So I really appreciated the last four chapters. Again, quite kaleidoscopic. We have discussions of neo-Catholicism, of De Maistre and Bonald on, on questions concerning history and sovereignty. We have a number of fascinating mathematical tales all kind of interwoven. And I think it really plays out beautifully in the last half of the book. Um, so again, I recommend this book for anyone interested in, in thinking about the role of science in policy, politics, but more, I would say, at the heart, this, this concept of a kind of culture of reason, a culture of order, how so social political questions just are endemic to that space. Um, you show that over and over again, really, really brilliantly. So I'll end with just a couple of questions. Um, in the last part of the book, the last chapter, you you repeat this this claim, which is to say that mathematics, and especially the question of mathematical purity, kind of occupies this essentially political space. And one thing that struck me just thinking about the book, having read it, is to what degree this was an opportune moment to show this, this is this just a case of the always political aspect of mathematical practice, or is this a special moment in the history 
of mathematics and science and politics that opened up a particularly rich opportunity to bring together Jacobin politics or reactionary politics or Catholic politics, reform movements and so on. To what degree do you, do you take that any, any mathematical kind of culture is inherently political? Um, and I ask that partly because one of the implications to me in the book, and again, it's because you're so generous with the, with the, um, the critics of algorithmic algebraic mathematics, is to what extent the origin of our own algorithmic culture can be found in this, this particular period, the, 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 the victory, let's say, of algebraic um, analysis. Um, to what extent is the book, and you sort of hesitate, you, you hesitate to talk about this, and maybe I'm pushing you too far, but to what extent are you preparing the ground for a call for a new reactionary mathematics, which would not look at all like the Neapolitan one, but might might have some kind of um, interesting resonance with contemporary ideas that go outside of this idea of calculation and prediction. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll end there, but thanks again for the opportunity to read. It was really, really fun. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Matthew, we want to respond. No, no, no Matthew. Right? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Massimo, for uh, for the wonderful book, and uh, David frames this beautifully. And and indeed, I think much of what I'm going to say is how uh, is thinking through how the sort of unruly, unruly, dense contextualization that Massimo provides um, gives the book so much of its uh, it, its place as a as a lever in thinking through major sort of questions, I think, of both historical practice, science studies, and indeed, um, so the kind of social theory, which I take to often happen here uh, in The Matrix, that it's very much a book about STS, uh, science and technology studies and history in tandem and intention and tugging on both, particularly by the case of mathematics. So David uh, mentioned sort of mathematics being the hard case. And some of you will know that David Bloor, one of the sort of founders of the Sociology of Scientific Knowledge in a book called Knowledge and Social Im Imagery, uh, first articulated the symmetry principle. And in the symmetry principle, you treat that which we hold to be true and that which we hold to be false. Um, symmetrically for explanation. And he said, the hard case is, of course, mathematics, and I'm going to do that. Um, and remarkably, not very many people followed him in doing this. A few, uh, including Donald McKenzie and, 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 and Massimo and uh, several other of us have been profoundly fascinated with it. But there's something about mathematics being challenging that uh, thus sets it out to be a, a challenging target for social theory, but also, I think, provides it with uh, the power to thus serve um, in the kind of critical ways that I think, that I intimate, that I think, Massimo, is, you're getting at. Um, and I, what most of my comments are going to be about what I take to be, uh, maybe I'm reading too much, many of the implications of what this local study helps us see, how it dislodges, how it helps us see particularly precisely a reactionary mathematics, which are the nature article, that weirdness. Um, makes it allows it to serve as a lever for further analysis rather than a substitute for a deplored rationalistic present. It's it's a way of looking at the past where nostalgia is the subject of the analysis rather than something we fall into. Um, so reactionary math is a powerful tool, and many of you may have encountered the way that, say, Edmund Burke is often lionized in odd ways today for his organicism, his anti-imperialism, um, and his and his anti -geoma and it's a peculiar move um, that leads to a kind of his a kind of nostalgia. And you quote Mark Lilla, who says that the reaction to the French Revolution has placed a cloud over European thinking. And it seems to me much of this book uses reactionary mathematics to help us think differently through this ma reactionary mathematics um, from the periphery. Um, so uh, the question I really have is about how does your book help us see the historization of different kinds of mathematics? Mathematics in the plural. Try to get Microsoft Word to let you write logics in the plural. It tells you it's not something you can do. Mathematics is in the plural, so it lets you do that. And that, it, it's so, it's like literally hardwired into our, uh, um, but how is different looking at multiple mathematics a lever against facile narratives and teleologies, say of rigor, but also nostalgia of a pre-quantified society or pre-mathematics? How do we use that without falling into them? So, I've already spoken too much, but I'm briefly going to talk about uh, nostalgia and the romance of the non-quantified, and 
nostalgia and the romance of the localized past. So in the what I mean by the romance of the non-quantified is it's it's you know a, it's enormously common across a whole wide variety of historical uh, thought, social theori- social theorizing, and I, I don't know, sort of folks epistemologies of the dangers into which we have been thrust by quantification, uh, much of which I share. But your book, by reminding us of the non-uniformity of mathematics, pushes against too facile a narrative of what it means to become uh, mathematical or quantified by distinguishing between the analytic uh, and the synthetic, and then in part way through the morphing of the analytic into the technical, the statistical, the cost accounting. Um, it asks for us to recognize that plurality and then to ask what are the plurality of purifications to be explained? We, we haven't really talked about this so much, but one of the things that Massimo shows beautifully is a kind of purification that happens in synthetic geometry in which metaphysics and theological truths are outside of the domain of mathematics on the one hand, and another one in a, a, a analysis in which that hubristic ambition to transform everything along egalitarian lines is tamed, and it becomes a merely technical discipline. So your work asks us to, to, to specify what those purifications are, and both in content and in cause, and to think therefore differently about very big stories that we often think about in the history of science. Questions of how is it that we become disinterested or bracketed from, met- say, metaphysical concerns or political concerns. And you do have two very different stories of that. Mathematics is independent of and beneath metaphysics, um, not the Kantian story, but this counter-revolutionary one. And then a neutrality of a counter-revolutionary statistics, uh, the, the transformation of Jacobin math into a liberal sorts of things, a transformation of it into uh, a, a technical analytical quantification as a potential master discipline. Now, I take it here, I'm reading into the text, but you are thus have a local history that speaks to our very current concerns about quantification and its claims to mastery. Um, and your reactionary critics is often were right about seeing, th- th- they were right that the Reformation was a big part of the problem because it had the wrong vision of the social organization of who was allowed to know. So Descartes was accused of being an enthusiast because like the Protestants, he thought everyone ought to be able to opine. But here's a question I was wondering for you. In your account of analytic mathematics, you talk about it being limited into a technical dom- in, 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 in a way. Um, but it's not quite the story of Cauchy, because it's not that it can't be applied to all domains of society. It, it is the case that it's not applied towards illegal- egalitarian means. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like um, your story is often very symmetrical, but you do treat in more fulsome detail the counter-revolutionary re- re- mathematics far more than the analytical ones. And so I, is it not the case that the purified analytic mathematics is just as hubristic and revolutionary as the Jacobin one, but it's anything but egalitarian? It is hubristic all expansive, but the shift is less in the structures of, it doesn't ask for a shift in the structures of society so much as a limitation of egalitarian hubris. Okay, so all of this is to say that the book pushes against a romance of a non-quantified society by showing the plurality of possible quantified societies. Um, And the second the kind of nostalgia I want to talk about is kind of the romance of the localized past. So you begin the book by reminding us of symmetries and symmetric exp- uh, uh, explanation. And again, to return to the original progenitors of the sociology of scientific knowledge, um, a kind of synchronic symmetry. But it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but one of the most interesting undercurrents of your your book is a kind of diachronic symmetry. Um, and you you show so clearly how the reactionary account is a nostalgic vision of the past, not something we ought to return to, but something that is quite constituted. David underscored this as well. Um, and I, I wonder to what extent you are therefore pushing against 
certain kinds of history, histories of technology, histories of labor, certain kinds of social history that um, for all of their analytical fortitude of the dangers of certain technologies often resolve into a nostalgia of a world we have lost. And that can be analytically powerful as in the, you know, the Jacobin Kula's book, Men in Measures, which pushes us against the teleological history of the metric system. But it can also be limiting, right? Immersing us in a nostalgia, which is a current construction of reaction. Um, how, how, how do we do dense local history of controversy, but resist the pull of those amodern uh, alternatives? Um, and uh, uh, so the, my question is, is that one of the goals of the book to navigate thinking that? And then finally, uh, just one sort of question. Your book is everywhere thinking from the periphery. Um, and once or twice, you mentioned texts like, uh, you know, provincializing Europe or provincializing the Enlightenment. Um, but I, I wonder if you might be a little more uh, uh, explicit about how thinking from the periphery enables uh, at once a sort of, uh, as it were, a non-nostalgic history of other pasts and other sorts of presence. And above all, how is it that thinking through multiple mathematics helps us push against the romanticization of the past we have lost, and then think differently about debates I know you've thought a lot about, about the current nature of quantification and dangers of rationalization, often which gets subsumed into some one sort of an a-analytical amorphous mass of, of alienation from ourselves because of the mathematical. If mathematical is plural, then that obviously can't be uniform. So thank you very much for your book. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to respond briefly? Yeah, yeah. briefly. Uh, I'll try to get some some of the things. Um, uh, yes, I mean, um, okay. Let me start from this. There, there are these two um, ideal types that I use. You know, like uh, the analytic reason and the reactionary reason. Because in a way, as as it has been said, this is a book about reason and the history of reason. I mean, mathematics is the rationalizing practices that we often use. To, to, to map, you know, reason. What kind of reason is act, is in action here? And you see that through, uh, mathematical practices. That's at least a good place to explore, to, to, to understand what kind of reason are these people giving for granted? What the idea of reason? So, uh, obviously these are two ideal types and they, what, I mean, the, 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 the story is about something that happens in between, right? Is there is always like a, is a spectrum by a different position. And in fact, I think what is interesting is, is often what is, is happening in between, which goes back also to the point of the, um, of the liberal and the neutrality. Because somehow, in, I often talk about the extreme version of the Jacobin analytic reason and the revolutionary emancipatory use of mathematics that they make. Then there is the, the reactionary, um, extreme version that I, describe uh, as having its own mathematics and its own set of um, cultural formations. Um, but at some point in what we call the age of restoration, uh, uh, what we see is that really what becomes mainstream is neither of those. Uh, the reactionary option politically is dead, you know, by the 20s. I mean, no one really thinks that there is going to be any kind of return to the pre-revolutionary world. Um, and of the, the revolutionary option is kind of survives underground and in many different ways, but it's definitely not on the table. So what's on the table is, and in the, using the case of Naples, but also elsewhere, is this kind of uh, the liberal option, right? And the liberal option is one that, interestingly, uh, takes on some of the of the elements of the analytic tradition, but detaches it from their own revolutionary potential. And so the creation of the technical as a space that now is the space of the engineer, the statistician, the cartographer, is essentially, I mean, Benjamin Costan is talking about the emergence of this new space in very interesting political terms, but it is uh, also a technical transformation, right? Because now there is this, this, this space that is the space for the technical elites that work for the for the government in the continental context at least 
um, and that are using this new kind of uh, it's still analysis. So on the surface, there is a lot of continuity. It's not that, and that's that's a tricky thing about mathematics, right? A lot of the techniques are the same, but but now the meaning of those techniques, the and the the scope of those techniques is is different. Um, so is to me that's one of the most interesting. It was one of the most interesting uh, things that I, I I came up with, like to see that. That's also where the genealogy of our own world can be traced, right? Because the rest seems really quite distant in many ways and uh, and eccentric. But if you look at that at that um, moment of the the creation of this of this space, uh, the technical space as a neutral space, because that's also uh, that's a new thing. Right? Uh, Jacobins would never think that the, the analytic tools I use are neutral. They, they know they're not, and that's why they value them. They're programmatically impure mathematical tools. The op on the opposite, we have the kind of the reactionary take, and what you have in this middle ground is a neutral, technocratic, often takes this kind of technocratic uh, um, uh, aspect, you know, it's the, 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 the corpse of the civil engineers. Now, on, on the French example, you have this kind of corpse all over continental Europe. Um, the knowledge that they use is highly considered. is 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 a kind of is a powerful kind of knowledge. Um, is a neutral knowledge. Is powerful because it's neutral because it doesn't side on with anyone politically. That's why the engineers are are powerful because what they say is that's the voice of science, right? That's the is the result of a neutral calculation. The fact that we need to build a road this way rather than that way, that's what engineers are saying. That's so so one of the ways in which I can see connections with you know the, the reflection that we often um make about the present moment is in a way is it is a it is a story of the of the giving for granted ne the neutrality of certain technical tools. And that is just something that emerges at a very specific moment. Because neither the revolutionaries nor the conservatives think that their mathematical tools are neutral. The conservative, uh, the reactionaries, are very aware that the way they do mathematics has an impact on the rest of society. So they willingly restrict themselves to a certain kind of use of mathematical tools. So in, at that moment, let's say the, the 90s, in the midst of revolutionary reaction, there, I mean, no one is arguing that math is, is, is actually neutral. But that's the outcome, if you want to pin it down, of the Napoleonic normalization. Uh, I mean, that's something that Ken Older right, shows very well with the techno-Jacobins that become the new elite right, of the engineers. Right? So in a way, this, I was following this from the mathematical side. Um, so that's uh, so that's one way um, and part of the story. Uh, I'm thinking about something else that uh, David was saying. Uh, any math culture is political. I mean, is this something that I would say? Um, I would say this is an interesting moment because the imagination of these people is overwhelmingly political. I mean, this is a moment of unprecedented crisis, or at least they think it is unprecedented crisis, and so. All they think is social order. I mean, either for restoring it or for transforming it. So the fact, so the, the mathematical imaginations is not detached from this overwhelming set of concerns. So by that standard, I wouldn't say that necessarily at any time when we consider mathematical cultures that might be different, a concern for for social order is necessarily the the, the first thing that you would immediately notice. Right? But it's definitely the case at this point, and also more generally, something that I think is actually always the case is that when we construct structures like logical mathematical structures, like call them this way, <laughs> we endure, we create new techniques, new mathematical techniques. What we are doing is we are creating new possibilities, new possibilities of thinking about the world in different ways, organizing the world in different ways, ordering the world and reordering it, right? So the more techniques we have, the more we can think that we can reorganize what we know in different ways that are legitimated by mathematical logical structures. So if you think about this, then um, reducing mathematical 
the possibility of certain mathematical uh, options means reducing, restricting our political imagination. We cannot imagine at that point, or at least it seems illogical, to think that the world can be very much different from the way it is, because we have restricted the possibility of imagining structures that are completely different. So this is one way of reading what I was saying before uh, about the restriction of the legitimate uh, mathematical techniques that you can deploy in, say, thinking about political order. So this, I think, is a, is a, is a constant. The fact that depending on what mathematics you have, you you will you will tend to think about different possibilities right, in ordering and reordering the world. Uh, the fact that this is necessarily the the first most obvious and overwhelming um, social dimension that is expressed in you know by mathematical techniques that you know is more contingent. I think there might be other priorities and other things. Um, Sorry. Well, no, no, go ahead. I mean, we should open the floor, yeah, but yeah, we yeah, can yeah. also, uh, you guys no, can the come back. The nostalgia thing, yes, I was really, that, that's really uh, something I really uh, care about. And I think that's an, that's an important point. And, and I hope, yeah, my sense was to, 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 you know, with the idea of mathematical cultures as an antidote, right, to that sort of modern, pre modern, you know, quantification, post quantification, uh, that's not a real divide. You're right. Uh, so, so, yeah, so the, the floor is open.